Uh, no. So um, we'll get started. I want to welcome everyone. My name is Marcy Sklove, and I chair this task force, Racial Justice Task Force for the League of Women Voters. This, uh, the, the, the folks that are all signed up and joining us tonight, it really is very moving and exciting for us in the task force. Um, the interest in this event is really phenomenal and we're really happy about it. It also is somewhat timely uh, given, you know, the racial killings that happened in Atlanta last week and just generally how there's so much, so much work to be done. And it's very inspiring to see the interest in Amherst um, toward, toward doing this, this racial justice work. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that helps and encourages uh the to inform let me say that again encourages the informed and active participation of residents in government in and works to increase understanding of pub of major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy that's a pretty big sentence sorry i flubbed it a little bit um, but the League is doing really interesting work. We're always in a kind of interesting position of uh, this nonpartisanship, but also advocacy and keeping, keeping track of things that are important to society. So uh, we do encourage you all to look into um, our website and consider joining the League of Women Voters of Amherst. Um, so that I wanted to put in a plug for. This meeting is being recorded. It's also being streamed um, live on, on the Facebook page, Amherst League of Women Voters Facebook page. And that's a first, that's never happened before. And uh, I wanna welcome everyone who's joining us from Facebook. It's also being streamed at Amherst Media and they will be rebroadcasting the program in the days to come as well. So many thanks to Amherst Media for their work. Um, so the second hour of this program will be devoted to your questions and comments. That is the dialogue aspect of the program. If you have questions even now or at any time, in the chat, you will see four names, but please address your questions just to Sodesetti. She is the one who will be receiving all the questions. Uh, and um, I think that's all I needed to say. I want to uh, introduce our beloved moderator, Andrea Battle, who will take the program over for now. Thank you so much. Take that other and you did so long. <laughs> Thank you, Marcy. Um, and she is a really good leader of this task force. Uh, this has been some exciting work that we're trying to get started. And that's what we're talking, we're starting. Um, and I thank all of you who have agreed to participate. This is a very big first step. Um, and I'd like to introduce the participants of the group. Uh, first, the um, reparations for Amherst, like to introduce, you could just wave when I, you know, Michelle Miller and Matthew Andrews, I know he's here. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, then I would like to introduce in COBRA, we have, which is the national organization of, uh, of uh, uh, reparations in America and our own Kathleen Anderson. Hi, Kathleen. Um, and the Racial Equity Task Force, um, Dr. D. Shabazz and Dr. Emil Carr, Shabazz are here uh, representing them. Um, and then the POKU, People of Color United Club, that's part of Amherst Regional High School. Monica C Cage is president, right? Are you president? Yes. And Phoenix <laughs> Ferreira Ford is vice president. He's here too. Okay. Um, okay. And I'd like to also introduce Sadek Jewish Community 
of Amherst Racial Justice Initiative. P two people are representing them. Um, Amy Middleman and Rabbi Benjamin Weiner. <laughs> um, and last but certainly not least, our Interfaith Opportunities Network, ION, um, being represented by Anita Saro. I know she's here also. Um, and also I'd like to um, thank Kathy Campbell for all the work you're doing even up until this point. Thank you Amherst Media for coming in to help us by recording it. So it will be part of uh, an important part of Amherst Media's uh, repertoire. And um, you have four names in the chat. Remember Suda Seti, S-E-T-T-Y-S-U-D-H-A. Please, if they have a question or something you want to, and you want to know who you want to address to, or just in general, put it to her. Okay. Um, the groups all have a purpose that they, they fulfill. Um, I'm not going to ask you specifically to explain what your purpose is exactly, because we want to give you a full five minutes to answer the question that we um, sent to you to have answered. Uh, so I'm asking for the first group is the uh, reparations for Amherst, Michelle and Matthew and or, I don't know how you wanna do this, but could you answer um, the question? It says, given the current time in our country and in our town, and also knowing that we have your introductory statements and everyone is available to you, how would you like to talk about your work in bringing racial equity and justice to Amherst? So I'm asking the reparations for Amherst to go first. Sure, and I'll get us started. So uh, we would like to talk about reparations in terms of the movement. Um, last night was a big night for the reparations movement. Uh, some of you may have already heard that Evanston became the first city ever to offer reparation money to their black residents. So it was a, um, a, a really, really amazing um, culmination of, you know, over two years of work that brought them to that point. And I personally learned about that news um, in our own town council meeting last night, which was so neat. Uh, it so happened that after, you know, a few weeks of waiting to uh, speak uh, or, or actually have our a request that we made, Reparations Framers made a request to town manager Bockelman um, to, uh, to give us $5,000 uh, to help us to compensate black folks in the community for work that we're doing research and education. And so it just so happened that that conversation was occurring right as the vote or right after the vote had happened in Evanston and town manager Bockelman announced it uh, at the meeting. So it was a really um, neat moment. And um, I think that it, um, it sort of helped center from my perspective watching the meeting. I wasn't participating, but I was watching the meeting and it sort of helped to center and focus the conversation. Um, so I think that uh, right now we're in a place where we have requested this $5,000 um, and it uh, last night was, I think, favorably um, favorably uh, spoken about. And so we have no formal response yet on that, but it did um, more importantly, prompt a larger awareness uh, about making space for the town council to discuss reparations. And this is something we've really been waiting um, for to happen. So, Lynn, our, our wonderful um, president of our town council, asked us to come back and present at a future meeting um, so that they would have some context for discussing reparations as a council. 
Um, and so what we'll be presenting in the future is a disparity report that we've been working on for a couple months with an excellent uh, team of researchers. And uh, we're almost completed with that. Although uh, what we'd like to be able to do is to speak and, and take more oral interviews from past and uh, uh, present Black residents. And then uh, we had a couple weeks ago, uh, Alderman Robin Rue Simmons came and she led a discussion with Kathleen Anderson uh, with uh, about 21 Black stakeholders in the community and uh, they are working on a report as well. So we're hoping that we can get back into um, the town council and have an opportunity then to present our disparity data to make our case for reparations, as well as to really hear from the black community and what, um, you know, what they would like to see for reparations in Amherst. Um, and, and really that is the black community will really guide this process and lead this process and design what the repair will look like. So we're very eager to see um, how, how that report comes out. And of course there will be, and Kathleen will probably speak to this, but there will be more um, conversations that are going to occur within the black community in the coming weeks. So I'm going to pass it to Matthew quickly just to talk about the uh, national HR 40 bill um, to sort of round everything out. And you have uh, one more minute for this answer. Thank you. Um, great, thanks. Um, so as much as we're working on the local level and our main focus is on reparations in Amherst, um, we're also supportive of HR 40, which is the House resolution uh, to it's, it's basically a remedy bill to investigate um, and recommend solutions for reparations on the national level. Um, there's also a Senate bill S40 that's uh, happening at the same time. So we work locally on reparations here and we also support the national movement, which I'm sure Kathleen will talk more about. Thank you so much. Um, next is in Cobra, which um, Kathleen Anderson is our representative for this region. So take it away. Yeah, so um, the question had to do with our work here. And I just wanna say that uh, starting in 2000, I was part of the Becoming a Multicultural School System Committee for the uh, region, the school district region. Um, Coming out of that, I was the co-founder along with uh, Deb Roth Howe, Lori Benoit, who was the wife of the former town manager, um, Edith Allison and others, we organized the study circles dialogues on race and class. And so for, a number, for four years, we worked with over 350 town residents of various, um, from various segments of the town. And then um, out of that, uh, two, three, for six years, a number of people, including Edith Allison, um, worked with a group of students in the high school. Um, and then the uh, study circles dialogues on race and class had the vision keepers were a group of organizers from the study circles working together to um, continue this work on racial justice in the town. Out of the vision keepers came the radar group, the race action discipline rights group, where we um, worked with a number of people, including the um, Pat Onani Bako was one of the people who organized uh, Norma Jean, Dr. Norma Jean Anderson award for educators in this district who work for racial justice. I'm a former, the former president of the Amherst NAACP and then I'm the um, founder of the Community Circles, the um, Community Summit, which organized the leadership of social justice leaders throughout the uh, Connecticut River Valley. And one of the outcomes of that Community Summit was that each of the leadership groups would have a house party. And Marcy Sclove has organized the house party for the League of Women Voters, and we're doing that right now. I am now the um, 
female co-chair for the New England region of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And working through NCOBRA, I'm working with a group of people out of the um, Racial Justice Rising organization out of Greenfield and a couple of people out of Springfield working to um, address reparations in the state of Massachusetts. That would be the bill HD 5140 that um, Senator Bill Owens introduced in the 1980s, I believe. Um, so for a couple of decades, I've been working on racial justice issues in the town of Amherst. And now um, working towards uh, reparations. The, um, the uh, older woman from Evanston whose town just passed their reparations bill uh, worked with our um, stakeholders in Amherst, the black community members in the town of Amherst um, just to begin the conversation about what does reparations look like in our town. And so we've just started having those conversations and we'll be continuing to have the conversations in the weeks ahead. Um, uh, Alder woman um, uh, Simmons has been focused on her organization and the bill in, um, in Evanston. So um, now that that bill has passed, I'm looking forward to uh, initiating future conversations with her about reparations in Amherst and what that looks like for us. Kathleen, you have one more minute. Sorry. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so people can- no, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> people can go to uh, incobra.org on the web to look at the areas that uh, Incobra espouses as important for addressing reparations. Interestingly, those uh, five injury areas they're called in, in COBRA are also similar to, if not the same as, the five game changer uh, issues that the uh, NAACP talks about. So go to incobra.org to get more information about NCOBRA. Um, we have a Facebook page for the uh, New England region. It's uh, New England in Cobra on Facebook. And so um, you can stay abreast of the various issues around reparations and justice that are posted there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, um, you know, I think everybody has copies of the sheets um, that describe the different agencies. So in Cobra, and that address is in there also. Um, next, um, the Racial Equity Task Force. Um, are, are you clear on the question? Because I know we've moved on, but um, the current situation, um, how would you like to talk about your work bringing racial equity and justice to Amherst? So, Doctors Shabazz. <laughs> this. Well, I'll say a little bit. Um, I'm an historian, so I always uh, oftentimes approach things historically, and but I'm asked to cut to the chase. But I, as I said, for me, history is the chase. But um, uh, as has been said, um, you know, when we arrived here in 2007, we didn't see much racial equity and justice work going on at all. Um, the, you know, a lot of it was very issue focused. We did note the race and discipline action rights or radar. Um, Ms. Patanona Baku is one of the founding members, another active member with that, Michael Burkhardt. These were the two people who encouraged me to run for school, for school district, for the school committee. Um, Michael Burkhardt was my treasurer. Um, Ms. Onabaku put it, was the one put it in my head. But yet we did see a lot of problems were going on. Um, in fall of uh, 2007, there was a Halloween incident on the UMass campus where uh, Afro Latinx woman was humiliated, um, and you know everybody, no one knew what to do. Uh, we had in spring uh, for Super Bowl, uh, the evening of the, uh, 2008. Uh, Jason Vassell attacked in his dorm and um, the tables get turned all of a sudden uh, he finds himself 
facing um, District Attorney Elizabeth Scheibel wanting uh, 30 years, wanting him to go to prison for 30 years. The young man had never committed a crime, never had any brush with the law. The two people he was in the fight with, they're laughing on their way. They weren't, they weren't mar or mauled or, or harmed in any significant way by, by the fight. It was a fight. But um, uh, nonetheless, she wanted 30 years of this man, young man's life. Well, things organized around Jason Vassell's case. We met Ed and Vera Cage. They were fighting for a young man, that their nephew, that was locked up for life, a life conviction for a crime he did not commit. And, uh, and they, got the, they got a second trial. And in the second trial, that conviction was overturned. And, uh, and, and then later, there's a multi-million dollar settlement for the years of his life, the three plus years they robbed from him. So we saw a lot of problems going on, but the organization, the organization on the ground we saw is really lacking. Um, good people around, you know, Ray Elliott, one of my mentors, my elders, you know, forming the Citizens for Racial Amity now with just the basic idea that we need more amity uh, more uh, to bring us together. You know, the, um, we were, the last time I was to get with them was to play the game, uh, the race amity game. And, um, but, uh, but unfortunately he passed on and we didn't get to, I didn't get to play that game with them, but his work continues, his legacy continues. So anyway, fast forward now, um, <clears throat> in the wake of the killing of, uh, no knock killing of uh, Brianna Taylor and of uh, uh, George Floyd, uh, we find a, a lot of concern with what's going on. So as calls came to us, you know, what's going on? What are we doing? What's happening? Uh, you know, we go into action. This is what we do. And, uh, you know, talk to the chief, talk to, uh, and, and pull the meeting together with him and Captain Team, because people are concerned. Could what happened in Minneapolis or, in, or in, in Kentucky, could it happen here? And, you know, wanting to talk about what's the accountability? What are the mechanisms in place? What's the training like? People had a lot of questions on their mind and they got together with us. And we had a, in this virtual format, an extensive discussion with him. And, these, and, and interestingly, he says in that meeting that he welcomed some type of citizen, civilian oversight, review body or whatever. And yet here we are months later, still moving along, still go slow with our, our council manager form of government to uh, 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 endlessly deliberate before we ever get to some get to some action. But again, that's where we have to take charge as people. That's where we have to uh, organize and continue to apply pressure because the people in power never do it without it. They'll never do it, but they'll have a million other things on their minds before they concern themselves with racial equity and justice. You can well, believe Dr. that. Dr. Shabazz, on this particular question, you have about 30 seconds more. Sorry. I yield, I yield the balance of my time. Oh, <laughs> Dee, do you want to jump in there? Um, just, you know, in terms of racial equity uh, during the time of COVID, but the, the horrible summer of 2020, um we felt compelled as a community to come together and really look at what could change what could move forward how can we challenge those in power in this community and that's why we formed the racial equity task force of amherst great thank you so much um the next group that i'd like to ask uh to speak on this is um the People of Color United, POKU of the high school. Uh, do you need the question again or are you good? Nah, we're all good. Oh, good. I knew young people always. <laughs> good way. Hi, so uh, my name is Phoenix Redford, Vice President of POKU for those of us just joining now. Um, so we just wanted to talk about like things that work that we have done in this town has been just community events that all of us have cooperated in, such as the um, speeches that the Amherst faculty, staff, and teachers put on during the summer after the murder of George Floyd. Myself and Monica and three other POKU members all spoke. And we know that our words as youth give power and energize other folks so that this work that we are trying to do, racial equity, can be solved in our lifetimes. 
Um, also, another thing that we've been doing um, is this group that we created in this following year um, revolving around the election of 2021. And that was the Defending Democracy group. And our main, main goals for this group was to have a discussion with the students of color and students of our school revolving around how they're feeling about this election because there's a lot of tension going on in our country and our school as many people know. Um, another thing that we've done is the march coming up on Saturday, standing in solidarity with our Asian American fellow students at Amherst High. And yeah, Monica. Yes, yeah, so we've been involved with those you know, rallies and protests over the summer. Um, a group that was an extension of POKU, we had a few POKU members, it was called Youth for BLM, Black Lives Matter, right? And so we held a march starting at the high school, um, ending at Switzer Park, um, right in front of the police station. Um, yeah, we had a few students speaking there. Another thing that POKU has done when there was the graffiti that was left outside of the high school um, a few months ago, there was a racial slur and an image that was like, you know, um, scrawled into the sidewalk outside of the high school. Um, our, like what we've learned as, you know, you know, very engaged students is to not rely on the people of pow in power to, you know, create the change that I want to see. Like, we have to do that for ourselves, right? So we reached out to Mr. Sidiku, who is one of the assistant principals at the high school, and we had a meeting with him to see how, how do we move forward? How are we going to be there for our students of color? Um, because there's no way that we can leave this alone. And so Poku around this time, we had just started our Instagram account so we can not only reach students of color within the high school, but we asked like, how can we connect with people in the town? How can we, you know, engage everyone so we're not just a club at the high school? Um, and we gained a lot of, you know, traction. A lot of people saw our posts like asking, how, how do we feel about, you know, how racial slurs are still being thrown around in Amherst, in Amherst High School that's supposed to be so loving and supportive to our students. So that's that's one way that POKU has been very involved. Is thank you very is that it? Okay, thank you very much, both of you. Um, the next group I um, wanted to ask is SEDEC, the Jewish Community of Amherst Racial Justice Initiative, and representing them are um, Rabbi, um, <laughs> Rabbi Benjamin Weiner and Amy Middleman. So take it away. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm Rabbi Benjamin Weiner of the Jewish Community of Amherst. Um, SEDEC, which is a Hebrew word that means justice, is a project of the JCA, which came into being um, last late spring uh, summer in response to the murder of George Floyd. I'm here purely as a figurehead. It was largely lay organized and um, uh, a number of amazing congregants at the JCA who felt that this was an important moment uh, uh, to join the struggle and who wanted to do it not just as individuals, but to do it within the context of Jewish community. Uh, and have been uh, leading that effort for us ever since. In terms of our work, to do uh, work like this in the context of what's essentially a, you know, a religious and ethnic uh, minority community like ours is a bit complex because it involves a, a high degree of internal conversation in addition as a way of building consensus around external action. So um, Amy will speak to some of the external action, but the, uh, the internal conversation that we've been engaging in um, study consciousness raising and conversation with ourselves largely relates to how, how do we um, uh, experience the issues uh, and the potential for activism around this as, as Jews specifically. Um, so there's been a great deal of, of internal conversation with that on two levels. Firstly, uh, drawing upon our own uh, legacy of, uh, of oppression and persecution, the way that that shaped our culture to find both um, 
uh, a religious basis for our action and also uh, uh, lessons from our own history that might be applicable. Um, and the other part about it is, is how do we as Jews, uh, uh, with white, those of us who have white skin, wrestle with the notion of, of white privilege? Uh, you know, as, as Jews only about a generation moved from a genocide, it's sometimes difficult to think about ourselves as being people of power as well. So part of that has been, uh, how do we come to terms with the reality of our own participation in white privilege? Yes. Um, and, uh, and then uh, build, the, with the overall goal being uh, building strong that this is important work that we should be engaging in as a Jewish community into the world. And I'll turn it over to Amy to finish the answer. Um, yeah, I think um, I was one of the organizers, but there, I'm not the only one. And um, we wanted, as the rabbi was saying, to do this social justice, racial equ equity work within the context of us being Jewish and with our, within our institution, which we all care a lot about. And, you know, our goal is one, to make um, the JCA a more actively racist, actively anti-racist, sorry, anti-racist institution. And then uh, in the work we've been doing, if we have learned um, things about what it means to be both an ethnic, ethnic uh, minority, but also have white privilege and bring that to the larger community. So that is the work we've been focused on. And as if you read our statement, we have subgroups that have been working on particular issues. One is reparations, another is criminal justice. And in general, we've just been trying to study the intersection of uh, racism, anti-racism and Judaism in America. Thank you so much. And last, but certainly not least, the Interfaith Opportunities Network, ION. Um, I like uh, a word with, for that. Are you good with the question already, um, Anita? I'm good. Anita? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so I think ION is unique. Uh, among the groups here tonight. It is a network. It's a group comprised of groups um, that started out as a way to build an understanding among Muslim, Jewish, and Christian faiths within Amherst. But now its 20 communities are more diversified and they reach even beyond Amherst. And although we frame our belief systems differently sometimes, we share concerns for peace and justice, a sense of purpose, a caring for others and doing good. So we've taken on some significant programs and projects that, that I wrote about in our statement. Um, uh, but uh, ION is, is evolving as all, all groups do. So it's not just about how we relate to each other in different faiths and where we can cooperate but how our faiths inform the way we view and react and act in response to what we see around us. So as for many, uh, George Floyd's murder was a galvanizing moment, a long overdue wake up call to dig into this work in a very meaningful way. And in immediate response, I had initiated, helped initiate the vigil that took place the following Sunday after George Floyd's death that attracted more than a thousand participants. And since then, two weekly vigils have continued ever since that day. One in Amherst on Tuesdays um, at five and another in South Hadley on Saturday mornings. But working for racial justice takes, on, takes more than vigils. Um, so at our meetings, um, because I on Foster's dialogue, uh, we started talking about where can we take this desire to work towards ra racial justice, to understand reparations, and what is this, where do, what do we bring to this dialogue that is unique? Um, how do we approach racial justice from our belief systems? Most of our uh, member communities are predominantly white, and some have never really addressed racism as squarely and in depth as we are now. 
Some have already found ways to translate belief into action. First Church, for example, has had an interracial and in interdenominational dialogues for years. And of course, just completed three and a half years of being sanctuary for Lucia Perez. Others are doing intensive work, and JC certainly has really been in the forefront of this. Um, how well thought out, how deliberate uh, their efforts have been is really an inspiring model. And Mount Toby also has developed opportunities for dialogue. The South Hadley Center Church Youth Group has done a lot of work in talking and understanding operations. But we're all in different places. So what can ION as a network do? It can be a method to share resources, encourage each other, deepen our understanding, and help develop a town-wide and region-wide energy and understanding of this important work. And that has in part left, led to one effort, which is to have a Zoom conference on April 25th on, on rep operations and racial equity from a faith framework. Uh, its working title right now is Intergathering for Racial Justice, but we're hoping for something a little bit spiffier. Um, it's going to be how, how do we look at our, our history? What is the role that religion had and has in perpetuating racism? What are examples within the faith communities of how to approach this um, in understanding and actions? Um, and, and really inspiring us all um, to, to take on the work of equity and reparations and repair more fully. And it's also going to be an opportunity to listen to people of African descent who will talk about their point of view through their lens of faith. It's open to all, uh, whether in a faith community or not. We all have beliefs and values. Often I hear someone say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. So that's fine. So give that spirituality a shape. Give it a definition. How does it inform an understanding of race and inequality? And how does it help us react to injustices that we see and propel us to action? And especially for us white folks, how do we help each other approach this with humility, with a willingness to listen, and with a willingness to be led? Um, one last thing that I do want to emphasize is that we're a network of groups. And because of that, we have the potential to reach a lot of people. So one value that we can bring to this table is the ability to magnify and amplify a message. We look for opportunities throughout our communities and beyond to spread the word, to share resources, and to really keep the energy up. So when your groups are doing something, when they want something, when they need something, please keep us in mind because we do, do have a, a, a wide net. Um, that yep. even goes beyond numbers. Great. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. You got it in. Thank you, all of you, for the first question. Now we're going to get to the second question. After this is done, we will be doing around the questions that people have asked either during this time or one of you may have sent it early. The second question to remind you all is, what are the obstacles that you are finding in Amherst? What makes the work hard for you? Andrea, you're muted. Andrea, you're muted. Um, okay. Because of the extra screen, it's covering me, so I'm holding the space bar down. Um, would anybody like to answer it by volunteer, or, or do I just pick somebody? I can start. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks again to the League of Women Voters of Amherst for holding uh, this event. <clears throat> um, when we talk about uh, barriers to uh, what we're trying to do in terms of racial equity, um, we have to look at specifically at Amherst as having structural 
barriers to not only racial equity in general, but in how we organize. So when I say that, we're talking about from the town government to our school district, to how this community is planned, real estate, everything. Because honestly, people of color do not have spaces or places where we can organize safely. That is of course complicated even more so due to COVID where we're all organizing online. That's what brought our group racial equity task force to hold people's assemblies. We didn't want to necessarily replicate and duplicate many of what we see as the hierarchical structures that are present within Amherst and that do not allow inclusivity. It doesn't even, um, you know, embrace it in a sense because of the bureaucracies and the layers of bureaucracies for people to engage and fully participate and enact in some ways, not only living here as, as a resident, but their citizenship. And so we created what's called the People's Assemblies. We borrowed it from uh, other activists, uh, particularly those in Jackson, Mississippi, that we saw as a successful model to bring people together, to voice concerns, and to begin to organize. And I think it did have a positive effect. We hope to continue these types of um, uh, forums in order to, to make that happen. It brought uh, folks together across a diversity of uh, racial, ethnic groups. Um, but you know, honestly, it's the structure here in Amherst that makes it really problematic in terms of uh, organizing. When we look at the, um, the, not only the town government and how it's set up, you know, uh, it was great being able to organize online uh, and listen in online, but it's very much class-based. We're talking about working people the working poor, because the poor are working all the time, they are asleep at, at the time when the, the town council meets. Folks who, where English is not their first language, they're locked out of the, the whole conversation because there is no translation. People who uh, maybe need uh, ASL, you know, in order to participate. These are things that I feel a community like Amherst could pay for, could value by bringing other folks in. And we still have not had that within the town, uh, the town council. Other uh, areas where structural, uh, we are structurally disenfranchised have to do with businesses. Businesses um, owned by people of color aren't really supported here in the way they should. This has been complicated by COVID. I know uh, for sure that folks that applied for funding through the state, they received, if they were a business owned by a person of color, they received less than many of the white businesses. So this is anecdotal evidence, but these are structural problems, structural challenges that are present in this town for people of color. Need we go on about some of the school district problems, the budget cuts, for instance, that are occurring right now. They are cutting a uh, bilingual uh, therapist, a counselor in the schools. We're talking about that's the largest growing group in the school district in terms of uh, folks where English is a second language. Yeah. So there are many problems. And those are, like I said, it has to do with the structures that are present. Thank you, perfect timing. Okay, all right. Um, would anybody else like to volunteer to go next? Or do I call somebody? I will. Michelle, are you looking or just go? Oh. Sure, I'm happy. I'm happy to Amherst, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, there are a lot of challenges uh, doing this work. And um, when I was thinking about the question, um, 
you know, one of the things that really stands out is we're in a predominantly white community. And we're also in a community of academics, um, which is wonderful. Um, and we're a strong community because of that, I think. But um, it also means that many of us are operating from a cognitive place most of the time and or, or much of the time. And that unfortunately upholds white supremacy. So um, all of the sort of behaviors that come along with that, um, you know, are present. And so the challenge I think for Matthew and I has been to really understand what, when we're organizing and um, activating, how can we do something counter to that? So we can, you know, feel, actually feel something. Um, because without that capacity to really feel and pause and be in the silence and um, make space, uh, we're sort of operating in these conditioned ways that uh, perpetuate harm. And so that's been our sort of work is really to focus on that and really listen um, and make connections with people, including, um, and impo most importantly, um, as we're doing this reparations work, uh, black members of the community. And so we've spent, um, you know, the past couple months doing our best to reach out and, and connect and really have that human, um, that human relationship. And um, just one last thing before I'll turn it over to Matthew is just to say that, uh, you know, our approach has been to not turn our backs on anyone. And when we're doing this work, it can be incredibly activating and triggering and we get impatient and frustrated. And, um, you know, we just try to keep leaning into it uh, as best we can um, and, and not counting or discounting anyone in the conversation. So um, that's my piece. And I think Matthew's still here, although I don't see him anymore. Are you here, Matthew? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You've got a couple of more minutes. Okay, great. Um, I'll just add to what Michelle said that Amherst and, and um, also to what Dee was talking about, Amherst is a white enclave and it didn't just happen by mistake that it became a white enclave. There's a process of neighborhood apartheid that um, has created Amherst. And it's not something that I think a lot of white people think about when they think about the history of the town and how it got to be this way. But Amherst, you know, even when we think about reparations, um, Amherst isn't just Amherst. The, the crime of opportunity theft that has taken place in this town, like the crime of um, displace or like kind of hoarding opportunity and keeping certain people out of those opportunities um, has not just happened to the current black residents of Amherst. It's happened to black residents who used to live here and don't live here anymore. And also people who would have loved to live in Amherst and partake of the opportunities, the great schools, the, the clean town, the safe neighborhoods, that Amherst has to offer, but we're prohibited from, from living here, either by direct racial covenants and, and kind of redlining as it were in Amherst as it happened, but also just the sense of being unwelcome here. Um, and so kind of grappling as a repara locally oriented reparations movement with what even is Amherst and who are the injured party to um, the, the crimes of opportunity theft that have happened in this town, is a challenging, slippery question. Um, not, you know, added, compounded by what Michelle talked about and how challenging it is just on an individual level to be present and open our hearts and bear the, the pain and on past and present of so many of our neighbors and friends and, uh, you know, uh, fellow citizens of Amherst. Thank you, Matthew. Perfect timing. Um, poke. 
can I get Poku to respond yeah. to um, what are the obstacles question? Okay. Yeah. Take it away. So the big problem that we do that I've seen is performative activism amongst our school, right? So we have students who are only engaging in these protest rallies, gatherings, just because they don't want to lose their friends who will call them out on why they're staying silent about very prominent issues, right? So they'll show up to these events, they'll take pictures, they'll post it on their social media, they'll raise their fist and say Black Lives Matter, but they they won't practice these same things like when they're in school or within their friend groups behind closed doors, right? Another thing that is in our that's an obstacle would be how students are engaged and how they are, you know, how they do care about these issues, but they're just sitting back and waiting for someone else to do the work for them. So um, like Poku is often called upon not only by students, but by adults and teachers to say like, what are you guys gonna do about this problem? Like, like, like what's the plan? What's the action plan? But why do we have to be the ones to propose these things and to make things happen? Like, you know, we're not, like we are full of like change makers and things and people who are very strong and have very powerful voices, but we still need to engage our community. It shouldn't just be students of color, you know, solving these problems when it's an issue involving everyone. Phoenix, what would you like to add? Um, yeah, hang on. We're also students in Amherst High which is a hard school like for me i'm part of three four different clubs i take all honors classes and i can't i there's only 24 hours in a day so having more students and more people more faculty doing the work would definitely break a lot of the barriers in terms of time restricting us to do everything that we want to do and also another thing is just difference in like agendas uh, for instance, when we when we were doing the Defending Democracy group, um, we had the idea that we were going to be making noise, doing speeches, doing an actual march around the town town common, but it's just like a silent walk. And I thought that, like as youth, we love to be loud, we love to get our point across. And I know that that doesn't sit well with a lot of people, but when we do do that, I feel like it's it's more powerful and it really gets work done. But, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, can I get, uh, oh, yes, okay. Ion, interface. I, I, I just wanted to, uh, to follow up on something that Monica said because um, just recently I was uh, listening to a short video uh, of of uh, Brittany Packnett, and uh, she's a, a, an activist. And what she talked about was the difference between an ally and accomplice and a co-conspirator in racial work and how an ally is one who shows up when it's convenient and an accomplice shows up when there is a risk and um, a co-conspirator is actually proactive and just really uh, getting out there and it really uh, was exactly what Monica was talking about and what what D and others you know the conversation we've been you know there uh, there is clearly systemic racism in Amherst as there is everywhere and when I think about systemic racism I think of the institutionalized racism and the interpersonal and and that you know, one leads to the other and one potentiates the other. And I think, you know, in going in reflecting on what ION is trying to do and what our individual communities are trying to do, there's a lot of language uh, that we have to learn. Um, we've, uh, we've got to hear white supremacy without defensiveness. Um, to willing to go into those spaces of discomfort. Um, and, and it's a first baby step, you know, to be able to 
identify kind of this unrecognized racism in, in all of us. And, and how, how do we learn that, uh, especially in predominantly white congregations uh, without asking BIPOC community who is inundated with this, um, with requests to, to talk to us, to teach us, to help us learn. But, but we have to recognize that when we're asking for that kind of learning, first we're asking an expert and it takes time and it takes energy and they should be compensated. But there also must be, and I will, I will ask this, you know, uh, of, of those of you, you know, in that community to, to see if I'm off the mark. But it, it does seem that when we're asking to hear those stories of trauma, we're asking the speaker to relive the trauma and that must have an emotional, you know, an emotional cost as well. So, uh, you know, I think this is very hard all in, in every way that we've, we've talked about. Um, and, and even especially in faith communities that are not monolithic, where conflict is to be avoided, where discomfort is to be avoided. Everybody wants to be, you know, nice, make nice. Um, but we have to get beyond that. We have, and that, that really is the hardest part when you're talking on an interpersonal racism level and a personal racism level. Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question? Is anybody, I don't know the protocol, um, are people allowed to speak on this? We would rather people do that and then we open it for, on a, in a dialogue if we could do that, okay? All right. We want to hear from our tremendous audience here. Please, please put your question um, in the chat to Sada. That would Thank be the um, um, Andrea, I'd like to go next. If okay, that's no, I was about to call you. <laughs> okay. Well, it's just because of what, of what uh, Anita was saying, and I think that the JCA is also taking baby steps. And uh, what the rabbi was referring to is that we feel it's very important to try to build consensus in our communities so that we can, uh, well, there won't be disgruntled congregants, but also so that we can be a cohesive united front. And um, of course, we, we are primarily Ashkenazi Jews who in America have acquired a, a, a big degree of whiteness. And so we've been trying to educate ourselves about both the um, diversity in our own broader Jewish community. The Jewish community in, in America is actually very diverse and is not just white Ashkenazi Jews. And then also trying to uh, make connections to the larger Amherst community to um, work on trying to be co-conspirators, but it has to be, I think it has to be a process because not everyone, you know, not everyone in Amherst is on the same page. Not everyone in the JCA is on the same page and certainly in our country, not everyone's on the same page. I mean, I'm also a historian and 20 years ago, I think if you said to most white people, you have white privilege, they wouldn't have had a clue of, of what you were talking about. So we've all been, and certainly since George Floyd's murder, been trying to educate ourselves about these concepts and they're complicated concepts with a lot of um, nuance and uh, you know you can't you can't get two out in front of your skis in a, in a faith-based um, institution you have to um, be mindful that uh, that a lot of people. I don't think it's that you have to avoid conflict at all, but a lot. You know, we're trying to do this work, both as social justice work, but also from a spiritual place, and to connect the social justice work to our spiritual and religious identities. And so you have to be aware that people join religious institutions for so many different reasons. And um, 
you have to be sensitive to that. I don't know if the rabbi wanted to add anything, but. Well, I would just reinforce what, what, what you said, Amy, that I don't think that um, being in a religious community is necessarily about avoiding conflict. I think at its best, it's the opposite. It's about learning how to lean into conflict from a place of, um, of uh, mutual love, I guess you could say. Yeah, like, respect, yeah. love, we, um, we understand. We we can to, to, to leverage, as it were, the sense of commitment we have to each other as a, as a community to try to take ourselves uh, to some of the hard places. And I guess the frustration can be that it often, at least at this point, seems like it's an insular conversation, like it can get a little navel gazing, like, uh, and we wonder where is, uh, where is it actually meeting need and where, where are we actually encountering uh, the needs of people of color and, and the work that we're purportedly doing on, on their behalf. So, but we hope that this is part of a trajectory that is uh, gonna uh, have a, a real serious and deep impact on the people that are participating in it and, and open themselves to all kinds of new awareness and, and new action. Thank you so much. And, and to wind it up, Sorry, were you not finished? I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to to uh, mention that I think that point of of uh, not avoiding conflict, but kind of loving conflict, where uh, you're you're able to bring people in um, instead. Of, you know, there's about Toby is doing a whole workshop on calling out versus calling in, calling in with love and and um, you know, working, working not to avoid conflict, but but to do it in a healthy way, the way the rabbi and Amy are, are suggesting. Okay, and Kathleen, can you bring it home now with the second question? What are your obstacles? And you know. yes, yes. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the obstacles I see is the silo syndrome. Uh, which is what caused me to um, organize the community summit. The silo syndrome where there's this group here doing this work and this group there doing that work and that group over there doing that work and they're doing similar work, but they're not talking to each other. And so um, my hope was that uh, by getting the leaders of these different groups together, we would have eventually what I started to call a uh, house party where each organization would invite people to a meeting of their organization so that the organizations could broaden their uh, reach and broaden their outlook and um, so start bringing groups together instead of having them separate. Um, so uh, and so everybody has, had, has made some very good points and, and I don't wanna reiterate them. They're all very good and poignant and, and purposeful for our discussion here. Um, what's hard in Amherst, there are a number of things that are, that are hard in Amherst. <laughs> um, this is an academic community, somebody mentioned that. And, um, and so there's this uh, sense I think that uh, there's a certain level of, of um, what, hmm, what I was going to say, expertise, a certain level of something, I'm not sure exactly how to, to define it, that comes with being in an academic, um, academic environment. So I have a master's degree in education, and uh, recently somebody asked me, well, where did you get your master's degree? <laughs> so there's this, like, this hierarchy of of um, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, um, so I, I guess I can't really add a lot more to what other people have said um, because everybody brought into this conversation the very obstacles that, that are very real and that have been here for decades, if not generations. So uh, this, question that I ask is, so what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Um, here we have an opportunity um, in this particular house party that the League of Women Voters is sponsoring 
to come together and to um, look at each other, to see who we are, to um, strategize on next steps we can take. So the, um, in terms of reparations, there's the, like I said, the group that is working on uh, reparations on the state level for Massachusetts. And then um, there's the uh, group that is working on reparations for the town of Amherst. Um, sometimes an obstacle is that <clears throat> people want stuff to happen quickly. If it doesn't happen in two months or in six months or a year or three years, then it doesn't happen and people lose interest and they go away. So to sustain the interest in these various issues over time um, is a obstacle that needs to be overcome. Um, so those are just some last final things that I want to um, insert that we really need to um, stay focused. You know, the, um, I think about the uh, Montgomery bus boycott. And there's this idea that, oh, well, Rosa Parks sat on, um, refused to give up her seat on the bus. And that's what caused people to then all of a sudden decide to boycott the bus. But what often people don't really know is that that had been a plan for 10 years that had been being organized for 10 years before um, before it ignited when Rosa Parks was um, arrested. And before her was a teenager who was also arrested and that didn't get people motivated, but the secretary of the NAACP, Rosa Parks, um, sparked the initiative. So we have to understand that you know, things don't happen overnight. We'd like them to. Uh, reparations initiative has been in the Senate um, for a number of decades now. A recent chart shows that there have been reparations paid to various groups in the United States and not one, zero, has gone to the um, descendants of the enslaved population here in the United States. So we have to keep working, we have to keep pushing, we have to keep our focus and work together. And so hopefully this will um, be another step of this organizing where people come together to have this conversation and that uh, we come together to take a particular action that we see Great. is useful. Thanks, Kathleen. Andrea, you're muted. Unmute, Andrea, please. OK, sorry. All six of the groups, thank you all for your, your answers. You know, I did see them, but to hear them vocalized really, really makes a difference. Um, and now, as, now that we've gotten through the questions we asked, now it's time to go to the next level. Um, there are uh, the dialogue portion of the program. Um, so we're going to ask, um, is it who, I don't know whether it's gonna be Meg or um, Suda, whoever's gonna read the questions. Um, if the person, if the people or persons want to ask a specific group, then let us know what it is. Otherwise we'll see who would like to answer it. So um, take it away, our question, people. So thanks, Andrea. I think it will be both me and Meg in different points who are asking questions that have come into the chat and that have come in otherwise. Um, to, to say that I'm, I'm going to uh, paraphrase a bit of this question and then also um, add in some other things that have been coming into the chat. Folks are very active, which I appreciate. <laughs> question follows up very nicely on the last one you posed, Andrea. 
Hello? Say it again. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Close up a little. I was going to say, it's okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The last one you posed, Andrea, and also on the comments that Kathleen had uh, shared earlier. So the first question is asking people on the panel to let um, audience members Dear. So that the work of their organization. You're yep. freaking up a little bit. Um, okay, Meg, do you want to go ahead and ask this question? The first one that we had ordered up? Uh, sure, I'm not quite. I will do that right now. Uh, so uh, why don't you ask it sort of since you halfway did ask it. Okay, let Let's me know if it doesn't come out. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, the question is asking for people on the panel to let, let folks know as specifically as possible how the work of their organization could be supported and how others could get involved in the work of their organization. And the question writer asks, um, I know uh, many white people who are newly aware of how bad racism still is, who have been studying the history of racism, they want to do something in the real world now, uh, and they're looking for ways to help. Um, and I want to just, as, a, as the panel is thinking about it, I'm also going to put in the chat for others to see um, various questions that have come in about uh, how to support these groups. So for example, for the uh, Monica and Phoenix, if you could share. Uh, oh, bummer. I can post it up, uh, in, in the uh, chat to let folks know how to, how to follow you. Oh, you're asking, um, you're asking Monica, Monica and Phoenix to say how people can follow them or also? No, I'm, I'm asking everyone, whoever would like to go first to talk specifically about how folks can help. And one of the very specific questions that came in, it was asking the, the folks at POKU if there's a, if, if A, um, they can, if people can attend their Saturday event to share some details about it and B, uh, if you would share the Instagram handle. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, maybe uh, maybe you guys can put it into the chat, you know, and say, you know, the Poku Instagram handle. You could put that there, so you know, and we'll we'll announce it also. Who would like to? Who would like to take this first? What what? Uh, Kathleen. Yeah. So um, so what people can do to help. Um, for the uh, issue of reparations, there are two people that I want you to find. They both have uh, YouTube uh, talk. You can do an internet search. If you have Google, use Google to search them. The first person is Sean Rochester. That's S H. A W N Rochester, like New York. His talk is the black tax, the cost of being black in America. And he gives a good historical context for reparations. The next person I want to mention is Leah, L E A H. Peniman, people may recognize that name. Peniman, um, she's related to a former Amherst Regional High School teacher. Leah Peniman is a farmer and educator, and she has an excellent talk um, titled Farming While Black. And she also gives a good historical perspective on uh, the history of, of Blacks in America, particularly around the farming issue. But those two African-American people are excellent voices to listen to. In terms of reparations for the state and for the nation, people can reach out to their representatives. Um, our representative in this area is Joe Comifer. I know w Mindy Dom was on the call. Um, she could be helpful. 
And then our state senators and representatives it both encouraged them to support the HR 40 bill, which is the House of Representatives bill and the Senate bill S 40. And then talk with your friends, neighbors and relatives about how they will actively support reparations. Andrea and the, and the Amherst Town Council. What was that? Oh, okay. With someone and else. The Amherst Town Council. And also, I, I just want to, uh, I, uh, when I was talking about um, the organizations that have been working on racial justice in, in Amherst, I did fail to mention um, Michael Burkhart and Russ Vernon Jones. And I wanted to make sure that they're both mentioned because they have given uh, a good amount of their energy towards uh, a justice system in our, particularly in our school system. Andrea, are we going on to the next question or more, more responses? You need to unmute. You're muted. Cause some, okay. I actually have a How question. How can we help? Uh, does anybody else, what, what can um, we I'm not, uh, I just wanted to say that any, some of our events are just for the JCA, but any of our events that are open to the public are open to the public and anyone is welcome to uh, attend them. We have a book and film group. We most recently, just Sunday, showed I'm Not Your Negro, which is a great film about James Baldwin. And um, you can really just probably go to the JCA website and see uh, the kinds of events we're having and then I'll also put my my name in the chat and anyone who's interested um, in um, joining any of our subgroups, you um, you can join a subgroup. You cannot, um, because if you're not a member of the JCA, you wouldn't be able to be a chair of a subgroup, but you're more than welcome to be a member of one of the subgroups, which are um, the book and film group, um, a vetting group, which is essentially to, um, to look at organizations, causes and actions that we can recommend to the JCA community to get more involved in either through action or funds. Um, the action group, which is looking at criminal justice and policing and the uh, reparations group, which is self-named. Thank you. Monica also had her hand up. Monica, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. So ways that um, people can support POKU is by donating to our club, right? Every year we have the opportunity of going on these beautiful trips. And um, I remember, I think it was my sophomore year we took a trip to harlem and we um you know watched amateur night at the apollo we broke off into little groups and like we're, we were able to tour the city right but that wouldn't have happened if we weren't able to pay for the buses and things like that and it's it, it poku goes on so many beautiful trips that are so they're very educational and you know, a lot of kids don't have the means to like travel, right? So even though I won't be able to, you know, experience like or benefit from that, like definitely the generations to come if Poku is still around, like that's, these are amazing opportunities. And the Instagram handle is Poku, P O C. CU underscore 413, and it should be in the chat now. Um, Phoenix can explain more about the event on Saturday. All right. Well, first, I just want to say my internet connection might be a little unstable. No longer. So if you can't hear me, just let me know. I can put it in the chat and then we can move on. Oh, it was Monica finishing there. 
Well, all right, let's go. Um, so in terms of the march happening on Saturday, um, Poku isn't running it, but we're going to be um, working with another group that is running it. We're just showing our solidarity with the um, Asian Americans in Amherst. Um, but it's going to be located in the Amherst Town Common and starting at one o'clock on Saturday. For those of you that are wondering, and please show up. It'd be great support to the hideous murders that happened over this past week. Yeah. Great. And um, speaking of events, um, uh, I and will be having that Zoom based event um, on uh, interfaith conversations about racial justice, and that's April 25th. And um, the information will be on our website, which is at interfaithamherst.org. And I'll put that in the chat as well. And I'll add in a, a one more event on April 27th. I, I just want to interrupt a second. Sure. Um, Thank you. The events and things can go into the chat. I really yeah. want to hear more substantive things mm -hmm. from people. And I see Dee has her hand raised. Uh, but I, we have such limited time. I really yes. want to and we've, got, we've got some really good provocative questions that have come in yeah, too. Yeah, let's, let's not get bogged down in the weeds of the events. We can, we can also put all of these events and other things into the League website and the Facebook pages, et cetera. Thank you. Dee? So I just want to speak real quick about when people talk about what can we do? something you can do on a daily basis besides just being interpersonally much more um you know embrace of kind of love your sister and brother how you would want to be loved it is looking around you when you are in a space and place and trying to figure out why aren't people of color there with me if you were on a board, most of our nonprofits in this town are run by white people. They are populated by white people. Ask, where are the people of color and why aren't they here? And then do something about it. In our school district, budget cuts are happening that are affecting the most vulnerable in our community. Ask, why is that happening and put a stop to it. Use your budgets, whether it's on the town council or in the school district, to vote our values and really, really make that clear. So when people ask, what can you do on an everyday basis, look at the groups, your places of worship, your uh, interactions in terms of businesses, et cetera, and figure out where are the people of color and what can I do to bring uh, them into uh, these, these spaces and places that are mainly white. Um, I want to uh, include my uh, friend and fellow activist, um, Isolda, uh, I am uh, Isolda's part of the Racial Equity Task Force, and she wanted to say a little bit about this real quick. I know that we have other questions. So oh, I apologize for not being on camera. I'm literally working on a giant contract renewal while I listen to you, and I have limited bandwidth, so I apologize for that. Thank you so much for organizing this. And I just wanted to point out an example of what Dee is saying to this question. Um, when the town council put forward the goals uh, for the town manager, how is the town manager of Amherst to be evaluated for the next year? Initially, racial equity and justice were not even mentioned in those goals and that evaluation document. So the really concrete question is, um, did Isolda, Dimitri, and Shabazz need to be there for those goals to be mentioned? And I should say there's other members of the task force here, Anita Cerro, Carly, and many others have participated and supported, Rosana Salazar, Jose Lugo, and others. But it was a fascinating moment because here we have a document that tells you what the top executive in town will be focused on, evaluated on. We wrote a response to that and said the way to do this is to interweave the goals of racial equity into every goal. Um, that was rejected and many of you know the story. However, the issue was brought more to the forefront. 
And that's an example where uh, white, uh, I like the co-collaborators, conspirators, uh, whatever that phrase was, um, need to actually be attending these meetings because for many of us, this is very difficult. If it's not a Sunday afternoon, we will have no class diversity in these meetings. The majority of immigrant workers are working Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So just the, the selection of the time and the no interpretation, you've already, uh, you know, inadvertently, I understand, excluded many people, right? So what we really, uh, you know, I think it's people going to the town council meetings, getting informed about the issue, speaking out, same for school committee. How does this issue affect poor people and BIPOC people in town and anybody who is not being represented. And it will be in painful moments where your neighbors will say to you, we're preserving the environment. And will you be willing to say, how do we do that and have affordable housing? Um, and you know, question the budget. Are we allocating for, uh, for needs? Do we, why do we have a volunteer helping every single family um, and at South Point, fill out uh, paperwork for any, any needs because we don't have a part-time social worker in town. Um, why are we asking to, to cut the uh, EL interpreters in the schools? Uh, typically, because we don't, you know, we don't, it's very difficult for people to participate. So we really, you know, appreciate the opportunity and there's, there's a lot of, of everyday issues that are coming up. And so I appreciate um, Dimitri and Shabazz in, inviting us to, to be on the task force and to try to bring forward some of the issues and hope that many of you here will think about uh, organizing things in a way that um, doesn't center only people who are college educated, who do speak English and who are available um, at specific times. Thanks. Andrea, are we ready for another question? Yeah, yes, I think we are. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I appreciate, we appreciate Kathleen mentioning uh, Russ Vernon Jones and Michael Burkhart. A question from Russ Vernon Jones that came in before the session that's not unrelated to what we've been talking about. For white people who would like to follow and back BIPOC leaders, what are some of the constructive ways to do that in Amherst? And everybody doesn't have to answer, I think. I think just if you have something to say so that we can get as many of these questions asked mm -hmm. as possible. So, so do, and I have a bunch of questions that have come in. Yeah. Is anybody, anybody want to volunteer to answer that? This, this question could be generalized a little bit to talk about black leadership in town. Sure. So well, there's black lead, yeah. How can people support black leadership in town in Amherst specifically? Yeah, well, support people when they run for office uh, is one thing. Uh, see how you can lend support. Um, but the other thing is, um, you know, on this on this idea of reparative justice, and I say that to distinguish, as some put it, pure reparations from the kind of work we do on the local level. Pure reparations is HR 40, S 40. That's at the federal level. That's pure reparations, what we're hoping Will, will take place there. At the local level, this is repair work. This is reparative justice work. And, uh, you know, one way of supporting people, we, you know, change the name of this town. You know, if this, if this was Hitler, Massachusetts, would we, would we live here? Would we just say, ah, that's history, you know, whatever, you know, are, are we going to go with that? If this was George Wallace, you know, Wallace town, are we going to go with that? No, we need to change the name of this town. We need to support the cultural events, the public cultural events of the various cultures and peoples that are here and not do little little tequila parties or, or uh, Cinco de Mayo, you know, tequila events, you know, because, you know, you think it's, it's, it's chic or whatever. Also, raise the funds now. Evanston Community reparations fund exists now and people are giving to it and it's giving out to to concerns and to things that the black evanston community is you know is in need of so you know we don't have to wait on on uh, uh, uh Bokelman and the and the council start the fund now and start contributing towards it right now so those are those are just a few of the things i would say great does anybody else want to respond to that 
this, because I know you have a bunch of questions also. Okay, we could always come back to it. Can we give another question? Okay, uh, it's not unrelated uh, that came up about the reparations work. Uh, the question was how the, it's, which everyone is, you know, it's wonderful the reparations work that's going on. How uh, were the decisions made about which uh, BIPOC leaders to reach out to, to include in that work? If we're talking about reparations for slavery here, then it's not a BIPOC thing, it's a black thing. Okay. Right, right, right. And, Thank and you. The, yeah. And the question of black folk, black folk need to come together. And we got to first do, we got two things to figure out. One is, you know, given that this generates from the intergenerational trauma going back to slavery, but then how it never has been resolved and how that harm has been revisited over generations to the present, then in my own view, and I'm saying it as my individual view, anyone of African descent that is resident here and has been here for at least a decade, I would say, you know, welcome to the conversation. Welcome to the stakeholders community. I don't draw distinctions against Cape Verdean born or Nigerian born. If you're black, you live in a black experience, you claim a black identity and you've been and you're resident here and you've been here a while, then I think you, you know, have a seat at the table. Uh, now I know other folks have different views of that. And at the pure reparations level of the federal, of the federal issue, yes, we can get more into the lineage question and who actually had ancestors that go back to, to the 19th century. Uh, but, but this isn't pure reparations. This is about repairing the intergenerational harm of a white supremacist, racist culture, racist structures that we can do if we commit ourselves to doing. Great. So the question is, how, how has the reparations group uh, chosen black stakeholders to partner with? I can speak something to that, Meg. Um, in addition to what Dr. Shabazz said, we invited, I think, around 70 different people. And no one was intentionally included or excluded. We tried to cast as broad a net as possible and contact as many people as we could. And the people who showed up are the people who showed up. Um, but the meeting that happened, the, the Black stakeholders meeting that happened a few weeks ago, was not the, the only or the last one. Um, and so this work is ongoing. So there isn't any kind of choosing going on. It's just a matter of uh, contacting people and, and um, trying to engage as many people as we could. And, and I would say that um, the group of people listed has been sent around to the group of people listed. <laughs> and um, uh, and also the request has gone out. If you see a name missing from that list, please send it to me. Um, I will resend the um, email to the list of people on the list so that it's fresh in people's mind. Please pay attention to it. I know that um, at least 65 people got it, got that email, and not everyone has responded. So, um, so that's that about how people were listed. We uh, put names of the people in our community that we knew. <laughs> we listed their names as we knew them, as they came to us. And so um, again, if there was a, a name missing from the list, I would ask people to uh, add to the list, send it to me at KDQ Anderson um, at Gmail. And um, we will be uh, organizing a next session soon enough, as soon as I get the feedback from Alderwoman um, Simmons. Uh, again, she was working on the reparations at, in Evanston that was just passed. So I, she can wipe her brow now and, um, and have some time to, to respond to me. So that's that. If you didn't get the email, again, send me an email. Okay. Okay. Move on. I've got another question if someone doesn't have. Go ahead, Meg. Putting uh, white people, uh, how comfortable do you think white people are calling people 
in when racist things are said and heard and how do we support more of that, create a culture in Amherst where that's uh, expected and celebrate and welcome. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'll just speak for myself here and say not comfortable at all. I don't think white people are comfortable at all doing that. And it's very easy as a white person living in Amherst to be disconnected emotionally and even cognitively from the real situation of uh, black people in this town and around this town. It's very, very easy to be disconnected. So being connected, step one, and then actually participating in a meaningful way and speaking to someone when you see something, in, you know, D uh, spoke very clearly about the specific structural aspects of our community that are built on white supremacy. So um, how do we address those things? There's structures, but then there's, you know, people engaging with those structures and perpetuating those structures. And how do we engage in a conversation about that, all these things in a way that isn't um, aggressive or diminishing, but that is also very sincere and clear and doesn't hide from like Rabbi Ben was saying, like the high, leaning into the conflict. I, I think it's a real challenge. I, it's not something that I see happening a, a lot just from my own personal experience. And I know just as a, you know, as a person, um, it's, it's hard, it's scary, it's, uh, it's difficult, but it's absolutely necessary. Amy? Yeah, I, I also, I do think, I, I do think this is a place where education is really important, important, and then self-reflection because you can consider yourself like I consider myself a very progressive person who's been involved in activist politics really all my life, but I wound up living in this very white place and I didn't do it consciously. But I think I unconsciously benefited from a lot of structural things that helped me um, wind up in this place. So I think it's a process of realizing that about your own life as a white person, and then thinking how you can in a non um, aggressive way, <laughs> non threatening way, communicate that to other people, because you know, um, even in Amherst, there are probably a poor white people who think, what privilege do I have? Because they're very, they're poor and they're living paycheck to paycheck. So this is a very complicated thing. And I do think that systemic racism won't end unless white people actively end it, but we have to do the work. I'm going to ask, we're, we're nearing the time when we're supposed to stop, we're actually past it, but are there are a couple of really direct specific questions that have come in that are about things we could do in Amherst. How do we make sure the community, when the community safety working group makes its recommendations to the town manager and the town council, that those recommendations are put in place and they don't just get shelved somewhere collecting dust. And I'm going to ask the other one because I know there isn't going to be time to ask another, but for the last 20 years, Amherst has, since the creation of the Human Rights Commission over 20 years ago, uh, we uh, have not had a full-time human rights director for the last several years. That person should be able to act as a diversity, equity, and inclusion director, working with groups on complaints, but also working on community education. We've lost positions where there may have been a lack of support for individuals in those positions. How do we maintain support? for paid positions and long-term plans as funding and attention goes away over time. So two questions about funding staff positions and also the recommendations of the uh, Community Safety Working Group. I know we go till eight, Marcy, but I thought we, you had some closing things to say. We go till 8.30? 8.30, I mean. Um, I, I do have some closing things, but I also, uh, why don't we, Here's some responses to those questions Meg just said, and then I have, I okay. guess, the final question. Because these if, questions if I, have to do with Amherst, you know, uh, 
are and what we do. Okay, excuse me. Uh, yeah, if if I could respond to those because they both have have to have to do with with town government, and it is difficult for a lot of people to keep a track. I'm retired now. I can watch these things for hours. I've kind of become a junkie when it comes to you know, watching Amherst Media and, and the town council. And I think one sim simple but consistent thing that we can do is to make sure there should be at every meeting of council in some way, some discussion about uh, reparative justice and about racial equity and what is going on in the town. Because there, there is, it's easy to go on and, you know, talk about other things, but when, when it's talking about planning, when it's talking about climate, all of those things have racial components and um, disparities that, that come up all the time. So I think a simple thing that all of us can do is to keep, keep an ear open and use, use our voices. There is the ability to reach out to all of our uh, district representatives and to town manager and I think it's a matter of, of keeping the topic well to the fore of every discussion and every meeting. Someone's I agree with that. I echo that. And I just would say, you know, this calling in idea, um, it, it really comes from a place of love. I call in, for example, Alyssa Brewer all the time, you know, but it's because I, I, I love her. You know, and 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 I she was there when I the night I was elected to the school committee, she came out to the to the butternut, you know, uh uh community room. So I'll call her in on the issues because it comes from a place of love. I'll call out, I'll call in uh Lynn Greismer. You know, I've been to Lynn's home. I can call in, she may not know me from Adam, but I'll call her, call her in by name because it's a coming from a place of love. Now the men on the town council, somebody else gonna have to pick up the slack on that because I, I can't vouch for none of them men on this. So somebody else with a bigger heart than mine gonna have to deal with deal with those men on the council. Okay, it's a deal, okay. Wild Car. So here's what I wanna do. We just, we do have about 10 more minutes and um, I, I love Kathleen's just simple, question, what are we going to do? Where are we going from here? And I also am feeling very conscious of what Isolde was saying about the timing and the lack of translation about this meeting. And unfortunately, the League is having two forums that are going to be really important for how learning how to run for office. And both of them are also probably not at great times for people who are, are full-time workers and work into the evening. So I have that in my head. But here we have all these people together doing this good work in Amherst. And my question is, what do we do from here? Do, is there a next step? Do you all want to you know, try to create something to work not that anybody would be organizing or managing your own specific work, but is there a way to create some sort of a network or um, a support system for you all to communicate with each other and for us to have, uh, you know, for us to have some way to hold you, support you? Could the league do something in that way? Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear, you know, what your thoughts are on next steps. And apparently, ah, okay, and Russ Vernon Jones is asking, can there be an email list of attendees? We have created a database based on the registrations um, from, from all of you who registered. So yeah, we are creating an email list for I mean, I'm assuming people would be okay with sharing their email addresses, but for the groups, the panelists who spoke, especially the folks of color, I would really like to hear, is there a way that you can see moving forward to get us more, you know, more involved? So I'm gonna reiterate what I said earlier, budget your values. 
if this town is really about equity, equity, then we need to budget our values and that old adage of put your money where your mouth is, that's what we need to do. And we need to do it by attending the town council meetings, but also the school district meetings and make sure our voices are, are heard and we need to hold people's feet to the fire because BIPOC folk are exhausted. And so if we're going to have our white allies be real co-conspirators and be with us in, in terms of challenging what is, is occurring in this town and has occurred for hundreds of years in different forms, we're gonna need you there. But it can't just be, you know, uh, the, the pulpit of, of speaking. We must vote with our budget and it must speak our values and we have to do that together. Thank you, Dee. Um, you know, um, Marcy, Marcy, you know, we can't say it enough. We had the idea that maybe, depending on how things went, that the league could get involved with at least to the point of creating the network and really helping you all connect to each other or other kinds of things, or, you know, not take over any of it. We just will follow your leads whatever you need from us as a league. It's one of the reasons that even though I was pulling back, I got involved with the task force because they wanna to listen to what's going on and listen to what you're doing and then put our name, you know, our good name behind it. And, and again, we want, I mean, I know Monica's a, a member and, and Dee and other people are members of the league. We want a lot of you to come in the league and give us more and more ideas as we go on, as we work on people, how running for office, what to do, that kind of thing. So, you know, the idea of a network is something that we wanted to, to run by people who were here of at least having a place for people to connect to and we could, you know, dispense information. So, you know. I think the network is a good idea. If I could use the network real quick though, if you need more information, keep your hands down. But if you're ready to move with us right now to say that the cannabis revenue ought to go into a reparative justice fund. Will you raise your hand right now? Will you just say, say something right now? Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> it's a no brainer to me. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Let's legalize some more stuff. <laughs> so, um, so, okay. I guess what I want to say is now we want to be respectful of time. Uh, it's 825. One thing I want to say is if you're uncomfortable having your email listed in a database or passed to the other members of this meeting, could you email me? You all got emails from me. So if you would please email me, that would be great. And say, please do take me off the list. That's one thing I want to say. The other thing is that the statements that I sent to everybody who registered and the very few last registrants, I will send them to you tomorrow. Um, they have a lot of contact information for every group. So all your email addresses, all the contact information is in that statement of uh, participants. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great resource for you moving forward to contact each group as you want to, you know, it doesn't have to go through any of us. Um, let's see. Marcy, are we saving the chat? I am. Uh, we also- There's some resources in there that have been posted. Yeah, so I'm gonna save the chat. And I think part of what we will do in our task force as homework is go through all these resources and all these comments and um, post them on our page, the Racial Justice Task Force page of the League of Women Voters of Amherst website. So LWVA is the Amherst website, Amherst League website, and then we'll have our own page. So that can be a resource area from the League to, um, you know, your statements are on there and all of this, you know, moving forward, uh, communication can happen there. Um, 
So there's a few people who have their hand raised and all of this kind of stuff, but it's, I don't know where, how we want to take it from here. Uh, Andrea, do you? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, somebody, people have some questions, but we don't have very much time. Um, no. For this, um, we definitely may end up you know, we, we just want to get some ideas. So please, by all means, send it to Marcy and the, you know, the uh, league, as well as to some of the people who have participated in here. I'm sure they would like to hear your ideas also, um, yeah. you know, because certainly everyone spoke so beautifully. And I think we did a good job. But there are other groups out here that are, we want to join together and, and not be silos, as we, we've been talking about. And let's, let's join together, you know, people who can go and do this for this and people who can do this and really, really stand behind our young people, you know. So um, in, in all the efforts that they put forth, you know. So again, I don't think we're going to have time to, you know, because we're going to go past that, you know, whatever. And people, people are working. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, as far, oh, Kathleen? Yes, yes. So I, somebody just posted a question about uh, creating a calendar. And there is a community summit calendar that has been in existence, waiting for people to add to it. And I, what I'll do is um, send the information to Marcy so that you have it. But people need to post to it, go to look for it, go look at it. And um, perfect. So, yeah. It's already in place. We can use that as our format, if, if that's okay with you, Kathleen. That's, that's well, it's a community summit. It's what we're. It's what it's all about. Okay. All right. Well, maybe we should stop here. Um, I uh, have a giant bug in my room here. It just was big. So it got me distracted from my closing statements. Um, <laughs> I maybe it's a sign, you know. Maybe maybe it's it has something to do with. I don't know what. This has been amazing. Um, Thank you so much. I really really appreciate all of you who have come to share with us your work, your struggles. The communicating is just it's. It's just the beginning. It's really this whole event has been really intended to be the beginning. Um, Andrea, thank you so much for moderating and managing oh, all of that. Suda and Meg for the questions. <laughs> Kat Campbell, who's been our registrar and our behind the scenes host doing all of the technical stuff. Marla is uh, in the Facebook world. She's running the Facebook. So thank you to Marla. And uh, thank you all for coming and, and showing up for this. And hopefully it's not one of these things that really happens a lot in Amherst, like, oh, let's have an event. And then it fizzles. So um, let's see how we can keep it from, from fizzling. I think that's all I need to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.